Well, welcome and thank you for tuning in as always. It's Monday the 4th of May. Now, just before we start today, a bit of an apology for yesterday. I did write on my piece of paper that sinning was not allowed in German churches. Now, um, I would imagine sinning is discouraged in German churches, but singing is definitely banned. So I meant singing. Absolutely genuine mistake. I'm actually a bit dyslexic, so I often get words wrong, as you may well have noticed. Now, uh, lots of serious things to talk about today. I've just brought a selection of things that have, have brought, brought, grabbed my attention, really. Um, they're interesting, but the reason we're doing this is not because it's interesting, but because this is affecting people's lives. Our lives, my life, your life, and our family's lives, of course. This is why we want to interact with this material as, as we do. Now, let's just start off by looking at the, the official numbers. Um, so three and a half million uh, official cases, quarter of a million um, official deaths. Now, I want to start off thinking about the vaccine situation. Now, as we know, vaccine is the way that we're going to get out of this ultimately because we'll be able to give everyone immunity without them having have to have the disease first. So the Oxford uh, Centre, the Edward Jenner Centre in um, Oxford is uh, hosting this virtual conference. And it involves most countries, <clears throat> a lot of European countries, quite a few Asian countries. But it doesn't involve the US, it doesn't involve India and it doesn't involve China, unfortunately. So a bit of an omission. Um, more on those later. Now, they're trying to raise between 4.5 and $8 billion to absolutely go flat out on this vaccine. And the vaccine, they have declared, has to be globally available and affordable. So it has to be cheap and everyone has to get it. Basically, anyone watching this video is probably going to get this vaccine next year. It has to be for everyone to stop this pandemic. And they estimate it's going to take 18 months for complete scaled up stocks of vaccine to be arriving in clinics around the world. So it's not going to happen that quickly, as, as we've always feared. The conference is also going to be talking about improved testing and therapeutics. Again, we need tests that are dirt cheap and readily available and completely accurate. Now, at the moment, there's 160 UK hospitals trialing therapeutics. Now, these are actually not new drugs. They're other drugs that they're trying to see if they are efficacious in COVID-19 infection. Now, there's actually quite a long history of this in, in, in medical practice. Very often, the reason a drug is used is not the drug it was originally developed for. It just turns out to have other properties. There's quite a lot of precedent for that. So let's hope they come up with something. It may come from the antiviral drugs. It may come from something that's different. We don't know yet. Now, Donald Trump thinks the US will have a vaccine by the end of the year and I hope is right but I think that's optimistic but basically what we're seeing is here the US is gearing up now when the US gears up it can put men on the moon it can make atom bombs it can do amazing things that they're going to get a vaccine it's just a case of when and the same same with this international collaboration so we're going to end up with a few vaccines I firmly believe and I really hope I'm going to be involved in injecting them into arms next year. That would be a, quite a satisfying thing to do. Once we know it's efficacious, that it works. Once we know that it's safe. Now, I have talked about this before and I've been criticised quite a bit for it. But um, I'm going to talk about it, I think, maybe one more time until some more hard evidence comes along. The origins of this virus. Now, it is interesting now, we know that Donald the other day said that um, he's seen evidence that this virus arose in a lab in China. OK, but now Mike Pompeo is saying there's enormous evidence that the coronavirus pandemic originated in a laboratory in Wuhan, China. Now, let's be quite clear. Um, no one is saying this virus is a synthesized virus. Now, no one will admit this, but you and me, I think, know that governments around the world have made viruses for the purposes of biological warfare to use in defence. Let's hope no one ever uses it in offence. Well, let's hope no one ever uses it. 
But what is quite possible to do, it's quite possible to take a virus which is quite deadly, like a Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, the MERS virus, or a virus which is quite deadly like um, Ebola, and take the killing part of that virus out and mix that with the part of the virus that makes other viruses transmissible, such as the common cold, or measles, very transmissible viruses, and put those together. So in this world, there exists viruses contained within biological warfare laboratories. And this is not conspiracy theory. This is, this is a pretty well agreed science. There's viruses that are absolutely deadly and highly transmissible. Let's hope they never get out of those laboratories. So th we're not talking about that kind of virus. Make it clear, we're not talking about a, a synthesized warfare virus. The, the, uh, the intelligence authorities say there's no evidence for that. But what I believe is quite possible, and this is, seems to be the evidence that Mike and uh, Donald and others are talking about, and I'll give you more evidence for this in a minute, that the Chinese were experimenting on a virus in the Wuhan Institute of Virology, and someone just happened to catch it. One of the workers caught it, and, and that, that could have got it out into the community. That could have been it. So that could well be what was happening. Now... <clears throat> So there's that evidence there. Now, there is an emerging viruses group in, in Wuhan in the Institute of Virology. So this, this emerging viruses group does exist. It is there. That's, that's a documented fact. Now, MI6 is Military Intelligence 6. These are the intelligence people in my country. And they are saying now, or they're reputed to have said, and this comes from a source I'll tell you about in a minute, uh, that in, in the first wave in China the actual cases were four times higher than the Chinese were admitting to. Now, this is massively significant. This means the Chinese data has probably been wrong all the way through. And um, I, I really am um, trying hard to contain my rage at this because I don't want to be emotional on these, on these videos. But uh, the intelligence services believe that the Chinese were un under-reporting in other words, to put it another way, they were reporting 25% of the real numbers. At the start of a global pandemic, when information was everything, when facts were absolutely vital, the numbers were being underreported by a factor of 2.5. Now, this is from an Australian newspaper source. Um, despite evidence of human-to-human -human transmission from early December, the Chinese authorities denied this till the 20th of January. Now, this comes apparently from, uh, again, leaked intelligence sources. Now, I can't verify it, but this is not conspiracy theory stuff. This seems to be the case now. So um, th these, this Australian news source is saying that the intelligence agencies now know that the Chinese authorities knew that there was person-to-person -person transmission in early December. Now, if that is verified and, and that is the case, um, well, I'm not going to comment on that. It's just, it's just, if that's the case, it, it is outrageous beyond description. And they admitted it was person-to-person -person transmission on the 20th of January. So more to come on that, I fear. And the really serious point on this is, um, it actually makes me quite nervous if, if, if the evidence for this is there, then that's going to create international tensions. Of that, there is no doubt. It's a pity, in my view, that there was not meticulous transparency from the beginning. Now, <clears throat> I have got lots of interesting developments in countries to tell you about today. But I think it's going to be really useful because we've been doing this for a long time now and we kind of lose the, um, sometimes it's hard to see the wood for the tree. So what I'm going to do, I think I might do this for the rest of this video actually and just pose this as a separate video. What I'm going to do is just run through a bit of a, a timeline. My camera focuses, there we go. A bit of a timeline of this virus. So this Australian news source is saying that uh, early December, the Chinese authorities knew that this was a person-to-person -person virus. Let's see if that turns out to be the case. Now, this is what we know from the history. If you look back in, in these videos, you'll find quite a lot of this. Um, December the 31st, 
in the year 2019, which seems a long way away now to me now, doesn't it? Uh, 27 cases of atypical viral pneumonia <coughs> were reported in, in Wuhan. So it was a viral pneumonia, but it wasn't what, like one the doctors had seen before. It was an unusual type of viral pneumonia. Pneumonia being infection down in the tissues of the lungs, down at the level of the alveoli. Now, the 3rd of January, there was 44 cases of these atypical pneumonia. And that was traced, we were told that was traced, to the South China Seafood City, which is the wet market in Wuhan where they sell fish and um, wild animals. Abhorrent to me, and I'm sure to many of you, but nevertheless, that is what goes on. What is euphemistically called a wet market? So they were saying it was that, and they closed it down and made a big kerfuffle of closing that down and emptied it and all that. I'm sure you've saw the pictures at the time. Now, 8th of January uh, 2020, the coronavirus was identified on Chinese state media. So at this point, the Chinese were being completely upfront that there was a novel coronavirus identified causing this transmission. But at this time, they were still not admitting it. It was person to person. That was until the 20th of January. 11th of January, 61-year-old man dies and they were at pains to stress he had severe underlying health conditions. Now, this remains the same. People with underlying health conditions and the more elderly are more at risk. Um, but we now know that younger people can be affected as well. And we were told at the time that the risk of human to human transmission was low. And it may well be that that was known to be less than scientifically accurate at the time. US started screening flights from Wuhan on the 17th of January. Why on earth all flights from China weren't stopped at that point? Because on the 20th of January, there were cases in Beijing, uh, Shenzhen, Thailand, Japan. And the person-to-person -person transmission was confirmed at that case, at that time. So on the 20th of January, the world knew that the, it had spread around China and that there was person-to-person -person transmission. And yet the World Health Organization told us that it was safe to carry on flying in and out of China. Now, the, the combination of Chinese lack of transparency and the World Health Organization here and their lack of warning, in fact, their encouragement to carry on as normal is why we have this pandemic. And yet there's been no accountability. If I made that kind of mistake at work, I wouldn't be working for very long and I'm sure you wouldn't either. You know, the World Health Organization is the group that we pay to do this for us. And they failed at the most fundamental level. And yet the senior management are all still in place. It just beggars credulity. The level of failure here is why we have this pandemic. Try not to get annoyed. Now, um, <clears throat> 22nd of January, uh, Wuhan travel was locked down. And by that time, there'd been 17 deaths. So Wuhan was basically isolated from the rest of China, but people were still knocking around inside Wuhan. 24th of January, China, uh, trans, Chinese transport links shut down in 13 cities, but people were still flying in and out of these cities to the rest of the world. Go figure. Uh, now, the British government at this time assured us that the threat to the UK was low. And that's one of the points I remember thinking, just a minute. I'm not sure that's the case. In fact, I remember thinking at that time it was inevitable it would come here because it was a human to human transmitted virus. Now, not until the 30th of January did the World Health Organization declare a global health emergency. No one quite knows what that means. Everyone knows what a pandemic means, but no, no, they didn't do that. Global health emergency. Uh, the 31st of January, the United States declared a public health emergency. And on the 6th of February, Dr. Lee, who, of course, had warned everyone that would listen 
that this was a, a new SARS-type infectious pneumonia who had been actively suppressed, threatened by the Chinese authorities, forced to sign a paper of retraction by the local Chinese authorities. Uh, he died. 19th of uh, February, that should be a separate title, sorry. 19th of February, passengers were allowed to leave the Diamond Princess. You probably remember that. That was this wretched cruise ship in Japan that was... Um, I suppose the good thing about that was while it was appallingly handled by the Japanese authorities, uh, you might remember it was in Yokohama, wasn't it? Um, it did prove that this is a very transmissible person-to-person -person virus. So if anyone was in, had any lingering doubts at that time, then uh, the, the Diamond Princess dispelled them. And then deaths, uh, first deaths in Italy in uh, February the 22nd, February the 24th, the WHO said it has the characteristics of a pandemic. Whatever that is, I don't know. At the time, in fact, way before this, I remember saying if it walks like a duck, looks like a duck, quacks like a duck. Probably a duck. 29th of February, the Republic of Ireland had its first cases. Um, first death in the UK was the 5th of March. And on the 11th of March, the World Health Organization was good enough to let us know that the pandemic was a pandemic. Very, uh, very good of them to react a couple of months after they were required to act. Now, uh, the US uh, made a travel ban from Europe. I think it was just the day before that from memory. I think it was about the 13th, for 12th or 13th of March. Then that was extended to the UK and Ireland on the 14th of March. 20th of March, the pubs closed in my country. Big part of uh, British culture is going to the pub for a pint. They closed. UK lockdown began on the, on the 23rd of March. Now, I think if these go too long, then I have difficulty uploading them. So I think I'll put that one up as is. Tell you what we'll do. We'll look, we'll look at a few pictures. We'll look at a few pictures of my uh, excellent, uh, excellent followers or viewers, rather, I should say. Uh, and then we'll come back and do the country review separately. Good. So here we have Andrew in Seattle. And as we see, he's been sewing masks. So that is good. Thank you, Andrew, for the picture. I'm up in the top corner there. <laughs> I'm sure you'd noticed. Okay, this is Ava and Rachel in... Uh, they're in NC, but the trouble is I've forgotten where NC is. So my, my apologies, Ava and Rachel. But thank you for watching. And we notice that uh, Ava has a good taste in fountain pens, which I have no financial interest in whatsoever, I assure you. Candice and uh, Gordon in Texas. So thank you for that in Texas. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, North Carolina. I'm sorry, madam, I don't have your name. I'm not sure. But I'm glad to see you sewing. I'm sure you're sewing masks. So thank you for sending that in from uh, North Carolina. This is uh, Christopher in Alaska. Okay. Thank you for watching in Alaska. Yeah, a lot of people seem to watch me over food. Clementine and Zoltan in Switzerland. Good. As long as they're free-range eggs, that looks quite healthy. Good-looking salad there. Now, this could be anyone in the world, but it's not. It's Connie in Seattle <laughs> with her homemade protective gear. Thank you for sending that in, Connie. This is D And D. I'm sorry, I've completely forgotten where you are, D. I've completely forgotten. But uh, 
very good taste in uh, in face covering there and we, we talked about that it's a motorcycle mask the same as the one i was showing off the uh the other day this is a uh, dirija in india taking his vitamin d sixty thousand iu it's quite a high dose i take uh i take uh twenty thousand units a day which is uh, 50 micrograms yeah twenty thousand units is 50 micrograms i think that's right um this is duff watching in london thanks for the picture duff thank you for watching oh this is elaine who's a famous runner and she's doing a sponsored event that i'll put the link to for christian aid things that help people with this virus around the world but glad to see you're watching elaine not quite sure where you are definitely england somewhere wasn't it so that's elaine the well-known runner oh this is elaine's half marathon i'll put a link to that if anyone's interested in that 13 miles 192 and a half yards from what i remember and this is etta from new york and i'm hoping we're going to hear from etta again at some point but we'll keep that as a surprise if etta decides she'd like to talk to us again so thank you etta from new york thank you for watching i know you're having a busy time at the moment so it's good that you spend time to watch thank you francesca in quebec in canada just amazing the way people watch from all around the world it, it really is quite humbling this is gary who's in wales in the uk beautiful country of wales gary looks very high tech i'll show you my studio sometimes it's nothing like that <laughs> nothing like that Ishmael and uh, Georgina watching the UK with their cats. A lot of people seem to watch with cats. And this is JP and Sher in San Diego, who are very well protected. <laughs> so thank you both. This is uh, Lassis in Ghana. So Lassis there watching on his mobile phone in Ghana. Great to know people are watching in Africa. Excellent. I'm quite delighted by that. Oh, no, no, no. no. Now, this is Marla. Marla, I unconditionally apologise for calling you Marie. It's because I... Uh, no, I'm not going to make an excuse. It's because I'm quite incompetent. I, I apologise, Marla. No excuses. But this is definitively Marla. Excellent picture. Please accept my apologies for getting your name wrong. Uh, Michael in the US. Thank you, Michael. Robert in Scotland, up in Bonnie, Scotland, just north of me. Watching up there north of the border. Seem to have a lot of pictures today. I think we're nearly finished. This is Samuel in Canada, who appears to be musical. Maybe you could do as a, a soundtrack, uh, Samuel. We could do with a bit of music on this podcast, maybe. Simon in Sweden. Again, homemade masks. Good to see. Protecting those around about him. Terry and Frank in Derbyshire in England. Again, homemade masks. Jolly good. Glad to see people wearing masks and that's us for today. So um, what I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, put that up now and I'm going to, um, I've got a few interesting things from countries which we'll, we'll come back and look at shortly if you'd like to like to come back. So thanks for watching this one and do, do come back for the next one.